Hello, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jonah from Discover, and today we are going to be talking to James. James, how are you doing? Good, Jonah. How are you doing? Excellent. So excited for this event. I'm passionate about any life mind hacks, just how to get better at everything. So once I saw this was scheduled, I was just thrilled. And I'm going to do my little spiel just to make sure everyone is in the right place. And then I'll hand it over to James for his presentation. But welcome, everybody. Please pop in the chat. Let us know that you can hear and see us all right. Feel free to call out where you're tuning in from. We love to see people all over the globe tuning in. Also, feel free to call out something you're excited to learn, something you have learned from James or Discover, how you heard about James or Discover. We love hearing all of that. And also, feel free to pop any questions into the comments as they come up. We will have a dedicated Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if we don't answer them right away, we are not ignoring you. We've set us out that time so we can really get to everything. And if life happens around you, you have to get up, the dog comes in, you need a glass of water, or James is just going fast. I know he's got a lot he's going to try and offer us today. Feel free. Don't worry about it. We have a replay available. It's going to be on the YouTube page. It's going to be on the Discover event page, and it'll also be emailed to you along with the course link. We'll talk about that a little later, but just to make sure you're all in the right place, like I said, we are talking to James Garrett, and we're going to be talking about building habits that stick in 2022. This live workshop will teach you why 92% of New Year's resolutions fail every year, why our strongest instincts about habits are usually wrong, and what you can do about it. A little background on James. James is a brain science curator and neuroscience entrepreneur. He passionately believes that with the right tools, anyone can become whoever they imagine themselves to be. James spent six years doing psychology research at Columbia, Tufts, and Yale, an additional six years building brain-based curricula in partnership with the Queen of Jordan. A rare combination of scientist, trainer, and entrepreneur, his previous work in the Middle East was featured by the New York Times, Fast Company, and TEDx. James, I'm thrilled to dive in, and I want to get out of the way, so I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Jonah. Really no appreciate problem. it. So glad to be here, and thank you all for joining us. Um, this should be a really fun uh, experience today. Uh, of course, it's 2022. We're all thinking about what's coming this year. Um, this is a natural time for all of us to uh, think about our habits and and what we would like to change. And so habits end up being one of the main mechanisms or vehicles of change. And if you can get good at the skill set of habit formation, you really can get good at anything in your life, which I think is pretty exciting. So um, I want to start out by just uh, today we're going to be talking about habits in general, and then we're going to kind of for the first half, and then we're going to be talking about uh, mini habits and specifically using this particular tool to get motivation or momentum um, going in your life. So the first question that naturally comes up, you know, when I talk about habits is what good our habits. You know, it's like, why, why do we want to pursue habits? What is the value of habits? Um, Gretchen Rubin, a very famous science writer, said, uh, habits are the invisible architecture of our lives. I've always loved that quote because it, it gives you the sense of why habits matter and how um, they matter in this very powerful way, but they're often invisible, right, to us. Um, I want you to think about your brain here, because your brain is this kind of habit-making machine. It will make habits with or without your permission. So your brain's not going to ask you, you know, are you sure that you want to form that one? <laughs> um, that one might uh, cause you problems down the road. Your brain doesn't do that. Invisibly in the background, your brain is looking for patterns in your behavior. Your brain's a master pattern detector. And then when it spots a pattern, a pattern would be you doing something a few days in a row, it's going to naturally and automatically start turning that behavior, taking it from being a decision to turning it into a habit. Let me try to illustrate how this works. So decisions take place in our conscious mind. They are effortful. They are expensive. 
uh, decisions cost us a lot of neural energy, a lot of metabolic energy. It's uh, hard for the brain to make decisions. And your brain doesn't want to do this because your brain is an energy scrooge. So your brain being an energy scrooge is, um, it has plenty of it, right? It just doesn't want to spend it. Think of Uncle Scrooge, right? Loaded with dough, just doesn't want to dish it out. <laughs> wants to hoard it, wants to conserve it, right? He's a, he's a miser. And so our brains are cognitive misers. They conserve energy at all costs. And so what your brain is really doing with habits is trying to conserve energy. In other words, your brain is kind of indifferent as to whether or not the habit is good or bad for you. What your brain really cares about is that it's a habit and not a decision because that saves energy. Your brain is really habit agnostic is an, another way to say this. Um, again, energy screwed. Your brain has its own agenda, its own priorities. And if you know those priorities, you'll know, oh, my brain's up to this. And that's why it's forming, for example, quote, bad habits, right? So again, your brain will outsource any decision it can to the unconscious, because again, decisions take place in the conscious part of our brain. And habits take part in the unconscious or subconscious part of our brain. And that is in fact why they're so much easier to run. Decision-making, any conscious activity is incredibly neurally expensive. It takes a lot of energy to, to do those activities. Your brain would really prefer not to do them. All right, so this would be an example of a habit by default, right? So when we just allow our habits to kind of form without much intention behind them, we're really kind of allowing our environment to tell us what habits we do have and what habits we won't have or don't have. Um, and um, we're, we're, we're not in control of that process. We're not in, in the driver's seat of that habit-making machinery. It's just doing its thing. And so I want you to think about yourself as a habit designer, as a habit architect, to use that quote back from Gretchen Rubin that I used at the beginning, if habits are the invisible architecture of our lives, then who's architecting them? Is it randomness? Is it the environment? Is it the people around us? Or is it you? And so as you get clear on the value of designing your own habits, you'll start realizing, oh, all right, so my brain's going to make these habits with or without my permission. The only question is, which habits? And who's guiding that ship. And if I get squarely in control of that process, I can move that habit-making machinery toward my own goals. I can direct that habit-making system to produce the kinds of outcomes I want in my life over time. And this skill set of habit formation, which we're talking about, is a learnable skill that anyone, anyone can learn. Any guesses how many days it takes to form a new habit? Uh, again, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, this is, uh, there's usually a wide range um, of, uh, of how, how, how long habits take to form. Um, any guesses here on how many, how many days new habits take to form? The most common answer I get um, is shorter. Let me just say that it's shorter than it actually takes. Um, the most common answer ends up being around 21 days. Uh, but, but scientists have actually shown that, oh my goodness, it takes more than that. It's around 66. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the truth is habits take longer than we expect. So it's about two months. Now, even worse news, is that harder habits take even more time. So for example, exercise is a pretty difficult habit for most of us. 91 days is what scientists have shown exercise takes to, to, to really get into a secure habit, a stable habit, one that's gonna stick around as opposed to just disappear. Now. Good news is easier habits do take a little bit less time. 
Um, mini habits. Let me give you. Let me give you a quick example. So this uh, water bottle I'm holding up here. Uh, you know, it's a nice idea in the morning to to rehydrate. We typically dehydrate at night because we breathe out a lot of moisture. So in the morning, if I were to fill this up in the sink, set it on my nightstand, and then drink it first thing in the morning, that's going to take me, oh, you know, maybe two to three minutes. But that two to three minutes, um, you know, compared to another habit, is quite a bit easier. So easier habit that this new habit of drinking this my water bottle every morning might take me one month. Many habits, BJ Fogg, professor at Stanford, we'll get into it a bit later. Uh, estimates that take about one month to form many habits. So one to three months is kind of the range. Two months, 66 days is the average. All right, why does it take so long? This is the Nevada desert between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Um, you're looking at a view of that desert from a freeway called I-15. So I know some of you have probably driven on this road. Uh, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about here, but I want you to imagine pulling over to the shoulder of I-15 and then actually driving on the sagebrush. What happens at the speed of the car? Instantly drops from, you know, 70, 75 miles an hour to like five or 10, probably more like five miles an hour. The conversation with your friend or significant other drops. You don't have that conversation with them anymore because you're so focused on what's in front of you, you tell them to push pause on the conversation. Um, it's bumpy, you know, you're you're trying to hold on, but it's uh, it's rough out there. Everything in you, everything in you wants to get back to the comfort and ease of I-15. However, if you drive on this random patch of earth again and again and again, eventually this will happen. Tire tracks will form. So these tire tracks make driving on this stretch of desert just a little bit easier. You know, it's not amazing, but you can go maybe 10 or 15 miles an hour on these tire tracks. And if enough cars keep doing this, let's call it hundreds or maybe even thousands every day are driving on this random patch of earth, eventually it'll level out even more into a fully formed dirt road. And then you can do 25, maybe 30 miles an hour. So you're incrementally making that pathway easier and easier and easier to travel on. I want you to imagine the Nevada Department of Transportation folks looking at their satellite images, looking at all the roads in their you know, area and saying to themselves, oh, wow, there is this one road where we've got hundreds of cars every day driving on it. I don't know what they're doing. I just know that it's needed that we invest some resources in that road. It's critical that we put in some pavement right, on that road because it's so used. It's the most used dirt road in all of Nevada. And so it makes sense logically that they'd want to invest resources what in what is being used, right? That's what's driving that because resources are a cost. So what makes it worth it? The fact that it's so used. And they may even expand it if it's really used into a multi-lane you know, freeway. So again, this is kind of how ro roads and, and, and uh, transportation systems kind of change over time. So what does this have to do with the brain? Our brains are these complex interconnected system, this con complex interconnected system of neural two-lane tire tracks, dirt roads, two-lane highways, and six-lane freeways. So everything you do, every behavior has an underlying neurological Correlate. In other words, your brain fires in a particular area of your brain when you brush your teeth every day. And for example, this, this nice, smooth six-lane freeway here, that would be brushing your teeth with your dominant hand. And if you've never experimented with this, brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand would be the equivalent of driving on one of these little neighborhood roads. 
It's so awkward. It's you really have to think about it. You know, if you get every angle and you really feel uncoordinated. The reason isn't because you can't do it. It's because it's difficult to do. Think about trying to get from point A to point B in a big city. If there's no traffic, you're obviously going to take the freeway. Now, you can get from point A to point B taking back roads and neighborhood roads. It's just going to take you so much longer. So, of course, you want to take the most efficient route. So it's the same thing with your brain. Your brain wants to take the most efficient route. It's not very efficient to brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand because there's no neurological pathways, neural pathways that are strong enough with your non-dominant hand as compared to your dominant hand. So it's always going to choose the, the, the neural pathways that are the most robust. All right. So when it comes to habits, obviously what we're talking about is the changes in your brain as you do certain behaviors again and again and again and again. You build up these neural pathways. You build up these roads in your brain and they get stronger and stronger and stronger. And the stronger they get, the easier it is to do that behavior. This is why habits become kind of effortless over time is because your brain is physically changing and that's why you can actually do that behavior with so much more ease. All right, just in case you think this metaphor is, um, is, uh, is nice, but maybe not accurate. It's pretty, it's pretty dead accurate. Um, let me just zoom into the level of a single neuron. So neurons are like, look like trees. So if you went outside and ripped out a tree and turned it sideways, that's what a neuron looks like. You're seeing a diagram of one here. Uh, you've got the branches at the top of the tree. It's called dendrites. You've got the body of the cell and then down, 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 down. The trunk of the tree is the kind of pathway that the neural signals or the neurotransmitters actually travel down. And then it's kind of cut off here, but you've got roots at the end, synaptic terminals where the, where the neurochemicals or neurotransmitters sort of squirt out and connect to the next neuron and the, the chain reaction continues. So this happens incredibly fast, uh, but, but neurons um, are a communication system and the things that are being communicated travel down the trunk of the neuron and to the next neuron and then it continues that communication process. All right, so... What, is the, what are these sausage link looking things on the trunk of our neuron? They look weird, right? Uh, it's called myelin, myelin sheath. Now, myelin sheath is a really interesting substance. It's made, made of fatty tissue and it acts as insulation on, on the neuron. So the more myelin sheath you have on a single neuron, the faster that neuron will fire. So with low to little myelin, neurons fire at about two miles an hour. But with a fully insulated neuron, you know, when you get, and, and these rings of myelin get wrapped deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, um, you can, the neuron will fire at up to 200 miles an hour. So think of that range from two miles an hour to 200 miles an hour. The raw processing power of a single neuron can increase by 100 fold. It's wild, right? And so that ability, that dormant potential of every single one of your neurons exists within you. And just to like help you understand the, the mechanism of how this works, you actually have an entire set of neurons that are like the construction workers, the pavers. So they're called oligodendrocytes. I, sorry for the long word, but they call them oligos in the lab. So your oligos are sitting around, you know, taking it easy, looking at what's going on in the brain. And they're waiting for to see what you do today. And the activity or area of the brain that gets used right? Because every time we do something, our brain is activated and it's working to actually do that thing. The, the neurons that fire get wrapped with one more layer of, in, of myelin. So the oligos sitting around, wait to see what you do. And then whatever you do, whatever area of the brain fires, right? If you go for your morning run, if you, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, maybe drink a, a bottle of water, maybe you're, maybe you're trying to create a new habit of writing in a gratitude journal. 
whatever the new habit is. They see if you do that thing. And if you do that thing, they literally wrap those particular neurons with one more layer of myelin that are responsible for that particular behavior. And therefore, that behavior becomes easier and easier and easier to do over time. So again, think about, um, it's like a construction crew. And every time, so, so you, we don't, think of it this way. Behavior is the mechanism by which I can change my brain. We become what we do. <laughs> brain doesn't care who you are. It only cares what you do. And then based on what you do, it changes itself. It's this lovely uh, quote, neurons are a technology that turn experience into biology. Let's say that one more time. Neurons are a technology that turn experience into biology. We physically change our brains based on what we do every day. Pretty rad, right? All right. So here's the what this looks like going down, you know, a micro, um, like a looking at a microscopic view, just so you have a, a kind of sense of what this looks like. These are the rings of myelin on this outside of the axon. You're looking down the axon, um, and uh, yeah, this is the how your nervous system works. All right. So what we're talking about, of course, is called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the way that brains change, the science of how brains change over time. But what we're really talking about is, oh, my brain is like a muscle. And the more I exercise that particular muscle in particular ways, the stronger that muscle is going to get. So if I want to create a habit, again, of going running every morning, what I'm actually doing is training my brain, those particular parts that are, that are responsible for getting me out the door and then getting me on the run and then actually doing the run. I'm actually strengthening those neural pathways so that that run becomes automatic and effortless so that when my alarm goes off at 6 a.m., I'm basically halfway out the door before I even realize what I'm doing. That's what you're after with habits. You want these things to become automatic. All right, there's a... A uh, gentleman named William James, I, I, I'm guessing uh, uh, lots of you probably heard of him. He's, a, he's the father of modern American psychology. Very, very famous professor at Harvard uh, around the turn of the century, last, last turn of the century. And um, he said, you want to make your nervous system your ally instead of your enemy. So William James did a lot of writing on habits, how habits work. And... Um, what he realized is, oh, so the brain is making habits with or without your permission. You don't want to fight that tendency, that habit-making tendency of your brain. It'll keep doing it whether or not you want it to. What you really want to do is get in control of it. You want to get behind the will of that habit-making machinery. You want to steer it in the direction of your goals and therefore produce the kinds of outcomes that you want. You want to become a master of your nervous system and not have it be the master of you. Now, if this were all so easy, you know, and I'm probably making it sound a little bit easy, like, uh, you know, we can just snap our fingers and habits appear, um, uh, then we'd all have perfect habits, but we don't. Um, we have some good habits and others we'd like to improve. So what keeps us stuck? What are the things that we, what are the habit traps? One is that motivation is like a roller coaster. So sometimes you have really good motivation and sometimes you have really, really low motivation. And it's sort of hard to predict when you might have which kind of motivation, you know, a, a surge or a trough. Um, that's just the nature of motivation. It's up and down, up and down, up and down. So there's nothing wrong with you when you feel unmotivated. Your body is just doing what bodies do, which is going through energy cycles. Your, your motivation and energy are tightly linked. In some ways, your energy is your motivation. Um, but your body is going up and down, up and down all the time. They're called ultradian rhythms, actually. And um, you have about 90 minutes of good energy and about a 20-minute trough all throughout the day. right? So these are daytime energy cycles that mirror your nighttime sleep cycles. 90-20, 90-20, 90-20. So feeling unmotivated or exhausted or... Uh, like you just want to surf social media, is not only natural, it's your body just doing what bodies do, which is taking a little break between these 
high energy periods. Now, the thing about taking a break, right, between those high energy periods is that you don't, how do I say this? Anything that requires a lot of, of attention is not a break. Anything that requires a lot of attention is not a break. So if it requires very little light attention, you know, going for a walk, um, taking a nap, maybe any physical movement, yoga, doodling, drawing, um, anything that's sort of away from work, basically. You know, we work on our laptops usually or our computers. Um, step away from the computer, go for a walk. That would be the kind of thing that if you feel exhausted, if you feel the urge to, to be surfing the news or surfing social media or playing video games or whatever, know that that's your brain craving a brain break. It's asking for a brain break. When you feel the urge to distract yourself, what your brain is actually saying is, I need to recharge my battery. And, the, and what's hard is that it feels, it's basically reaching for empty calorie brain candy of the internet. Like, uh, I just need a distraction. Now, because our devices are um, attention heavy, you know, you, you, have to, you have to pay close attention right? you're, or you're using your attentional muscles essentially while you're on a device, they don't recharge your mental batteries. So they might be fun, that's different. Um, and there's nothing wrong with doing that, but it's not gonna actually recharge you getting a sort of distance actually psychological distance physical distance from the phone or, or device is actually what you're really looking for and nature and spe specifically is one of the things that recharges us the very most okay willpower runs out this is the other problem the other habit trap so willpower running out is um very very common and it's something that's usually not understood by most people so think of it like this you have a you wake up with a certain amount of willpower call it 95%. You didn't have a perfect night of sleep. You had a really good night of sleep, right? And as you go throughout your day, you're actually using up that mental energy, you're using up that willpower battery. So, so by the end of the day, you're really kind of exhausted. You're spent. This is why Ben and Jerry's looks so much more delicious in the freezer at 10 p.m. rather than 10 a.m. It's because you're tired at that point. This is why we binge watch Netflix at night and surf Instagram for hours on end at night because our willpower is on 2%. The brakes went out of our car. They're out of our brain. We have no more braking system in the brain anymore. And so all we got is like the urge to like, you know, doom scroll or whatever. And, um, and it's, not, it's not useful. Right, because we're we're basically we're we're not understanding what's going on, and so we get trapped into a, a sort of um, attentional hijack in, in in a way because we don't have the same self control that we usually do when our willpower is a little bit higher. All right, it's also true, for example, why we eat you know sweets or um, treats at night. It's because uh, our willpower runs out. I mean, I, I I should I should just say one thing briefly. Um, one, of the, one of the things to do, one of the implications for, for how to um, manage this is forcing functions. So if you know at night it's going to be tempting to surf your phone, cool. Find a way to get the phone out of sight. That would be good. In other words, charge it in the basement. Just like get it out of the common space, the kitchen, the living room, whatever. Um, definitely don't charge it on the nightstand. That's probably the most um, disruptive to our sleep and overall happiness and well-being because our sleep is linked to doing only sleep in bed and not not other activities. Um, I've taken to, and I'll just show you here, I've taken to actually locking my phone in a timed box. You can see the see the uh, um, the, 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 it's, it's the, if you're interested in the website, I think it's thekitchensafe.com. But you can actually buy these boxes where you, where you set the timer, you stick the phone in there or the sweets or whatever at night or whenever you feel like you're going to be most tempted. Um, and therefore, it locks and you just simply don't have access to them.
during that vulnerable period. All right, so these are some of the implications for how to work around this willpower problem. But really the biggest one when it comes to forming habits is this tool we're gonna to start going into now called mini habits. Now, mini habits are one of the most effective ways to get some momentum when it comes to habit formation. So how does this moment, how does this happen and who invented or came up with or did the research around mini habits? Well, it was this professor at Stanford. Um, his name is BJ Fogg, F-O-G-G. -G. And uh, he actually calls them tiny habits, but it's the same idea. So BJ Fogg had this problem and it's a problem I think a lot of us have had, which is I'm not doing enough exercise. I'm not doing enough exercise. I, uh, I'd like to do more. And um, every time he's saying to himself, every time that I do, uh, you know, set my New Year's resolutions, I, well, they fall, I fall off the wagon, right? By, by February or March. And so, you know, we're in a moment right now. It's January 13th. And uh, most of us are setting intentions for 2022. We're kind of on a, on, a, on a good, possibly still streak of our new goals. But the reality is we might have set them up wrong or set them up to, to, to not work as well as they could. And BJ Fogg kept finding himself in this trap. In other words, he would set up his uh, exercise goals and they'd always fail. So there he is behavioral scientist and he can't change his own behavior. I mean, that's embarrassing, right? So he goes, you know, maybe the problem is I'm just, maybe, and he looks back at what he's done over the last few years and he realizes that he's, he's very ambitious. He sets these huge, huge goals. And he goes, maybe the problem is that. Maybe I'm just trying too hard. Maybe the goal is too big and I need to shrink it. He says, you know what, what, what if I shrink it so that it's like super small? Maybe, maybe, so small, it feels a little ridiculous. I wonder what that would do. So he decides he's going to do two push-ups after he goes pee every single time. So he goes to the bathroom, does his two push-ups, back to the office. Goes to the bathroom later on, does two push-ups, back to the office. And this happens. So the first week or two, he's doing 14 to 18 push-ups a day. You know, nothing too exciting. But he's keeping track and he's noticing, oh, by week three, he's doing actually quite a bit more than he was doing in the first week or two. He's doing over 50 push-ups a day. And then by the end of the month, he's doing over 100 push-ups a day. And he finds this pattern curious. And he says, wow, I'm noticing two things. Obviously, number one is the habit's growing. It's not staying small. So a medium, a sort of mini habit's becoming sort of more like a it's not quite a medium habit, but it's somewhere between a mini habit and a medium-sized habit. And uh, and it's, I'm wildly consistent, whereas before I was very inconsistent. In other words, what he realized was that tiny habits or mini habits prioritize consistency over intensity. And so as he got consistent, wildly consistent with his habits, what he started to do on top of that pattern of consistency is to grow a little bit of intensity over time. So it's like he inverted the pattern. He wasn't like, let's go big or go home. He's like, let's go small, focus relentlessly on consistency, get that pattern and the behavior and the routine really locked in, and then we'll slowly grow on the intensity. All right, here's what he found. After he does this, he brings he, he then starts studying this in other people. You know, he brings hundreds of people into his lab and then thousands. He, he studies them in the home environments. This takes around 10 years or so for him to figure this all out. And here's what he finds. There are these different things that are in tension with each other when it comes to your habits. One is motivation. So you've got high motivation at the top, low motivation at the bottom. And the other is level of difficulty. So you've got easy to do on the right, hard to do on the left. And they're, con they're continuum, right? So what he found is everything up and to the right of this green curved line is a successful attempt at changing your behavior. In other words, again, I'm going to use this example of, of drinking a, you know, a bottle of water in the morning. 
Um, for most of us, that's going to take a few minutes. That's fairly easy. So it's on the right hand side of that horizontal uh, part of the axis. And so if you look to the left, how, what that's related to, it's motivation. You're just not going to need that much motivation to cross over that green threshold and successfully do the behavior you were attempting to do. Now, exercise, on the other hand, let's call out a 45 minute workout at the gym. You're gonna have to, you're probably gonna wanna, you know, inch that, or you're not gonna want to, but the, the nature of the activity is more difficult. So it's gonna inch you further and further toward that hard to do side of the continuum. And therefore, because of that, you're gonna need lots of motivation in order to cross over that green threshold. Actually, you're gonna need consistently high motivation to cross over that green threshold. Otherwise, what would happen is you'll stay in the habit failure zone. You won't do the behavior. Even maybe if you have decent motivation, you need high motivation. Decent motivation is not enough. All right, so this is the tension between motivation and difficulty. All right, we'll come back to that graph, I promise. Um, I pull this up here because often we, we think about New Year's resolutions and how many New Year's resolutions fail every year. Um, when I ask this question, how many New Year's resolutions fail? I want you to kind of get a number in your own mind. How many do you think fail every year? What percentage? Here's what the data show. Oh, snap. 92% of us are failing at our New Year's resolutions every year. So if you invert that number, 8% of us are succeeding. Oh, that's abysmal. Shoot. So collectively as a group of humans, us humans, are succeeding at our habits, our New Year's resolutions, 8% of the time. Wow. Wow, right? Now, again, I just talked earlier about the brain being very malleable. We can change our brains pretty easily, right? Or the brain is very, think of it this way, um, it's built for change. Intrinsic to the nervous system is that it changes. So why are we failing at changing ourselves? The reason I've come to believe that we don't do this, that, we, that it's not that we can't change, it's that we're not skilled at change yet. In other words, change, behavior change or habit formation is just a skill set. Now I have, a, I have an eight-year-old daughter and um, she's never taken piano lessons, but we've talked about it, she's, she's interested. And, um, I want you to imagine me putting in front of her a complicated piece of music. Let's call it Mozart's Magic Flute, or something like this. And um, let's just say I have a, a thing for that piece of music. And I say, you know, it's a, actually, I think that's an opera. I, I put it in front of her and I say, uh, you know, sweetie, why don't, why don't you just play that for dad? Why don't you play that for daddy, please? I, I would love to hear this. Why don't you tickle the ivories? She'd look at me and she'd be like, dad, you're crazy. And I'd be like, well, what do you mean? I would love to hear it. Why can't just please play it? And she'd be like, well, dad, duh. I don't, I've never taken lessons. And I'd be like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. You haven't taken lessons. So of course you're not going to be able to play it. This makes sense, right? Naturally makes sense when it comes to sports or music or language or whatever we're trying to learn. We haven't trained in that thing. It makes sense that you wouldn't be good at that thing. However, behavior change is the exact same thing. Habit formation, being good at changing our habits, is the exact same thing. It's a skill set. And skill sets take training, learning, coaching, and practice, most of all, practice. And so it's that practice bit that most of us never got. You know, when would you have learned to go to like, you know, habit forming class? Obviously, we were too busy like studying algebra and geometry to do that. You know, the central, think of this, it's so crazy. The central skill of a, of a good life is the ability to change our own behavior, right? If you can do that, you're going to have a good life. And you don't learn it anywhere. I mean, maybe a couple tips from one of your parents who happened to sort of be good, decent at habits, maybe, but like, Generally speaking, this is an this is a there's a vacuum of knowledge here. Nobody knows how to do this because we've never taught it. And the science, truthfully, 
until the last 10 to 20 years didn't have a good grasp on this, but we now do. We now know how to do this. So behavior change is a trainable thing. And one of the things that my course uh, and, and the other things I, I do and offer are about how to do that kind of change process and build this kind of skill set we're talking about. All right, I told you to get back to the graph. So why do so many people fail at their New Year's resolutions? The main reason is that most people start in the upper left corner of this graph where it's hard. You know, think, think of like what people are posting on social media at the beginning of the year. They're posting their six awesome goals, how they're going to have a six pack by June. They're going to increase the revenue in their business by like, 50% or maybe even double it. Their their relationship, you know, with their significant other is going to like look like some romantic, you know, comedy or something. Um they're they're going big. Whatever it is, they're going big. Their sleep goals, they're going to be getting in bed at 9 a.m. every night. And then life happens. That's life. Um, sometimes they're above that green line, you know, having a successful behavior change attempt and other times they're below it. They're above it. And then family comes into town. They're above it. And then one of their kids gets sick and then like life just keeps throwing curveballs. So the actual implementation of this new habit routine looks more like this. It's very inconsistent. And by the end of that, they feel so demoralized by all that inconsistency that they just give up. I don't know if you've ever felt that. I certainly have. It's demoralizing to feel like someday I'm missing two to three days a week on my new habit routine, right? So many habits are like, you know, no, 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 no. We're starting in the wrong corner. Let's start on the bottom right where it's easy to do this new behavior because it's so small. And then Again, prioritizing consistency, maybe we can over time, once that pattern of consistency is in place, slowly increase the intensity and get the, the behavior to be more and more difficult or more of like a fully formed habit or, a, or a, a, a more robust habit. So how do many habits work? Why are they so successful? Whereas other strategies tend to fail. Number one, and I've emphasized this repeatedly because I think this is one of the most important things of today's presentation is that they do in fact prioritize consistency. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Technically this was Will Durant summarizing Aristotle, but as the quote goes, um, the point is repeatedly, repeatedly. What do we do repeatedly? It's that repetition, right? That builds those, those oligos, kick into gear, build those myelin pathways the, on the neural pathways, wrap those in myelin, strengthen those neurons so that it becomes easier and easier and easier to do that behavior. We become our habits. And again, in this process, if we do it well, we focus and prioritize consistency, it will lead to deeply ingrained habits, which again, bear fruit over time. Whereas if we focus on intensity the way most of us do at this time of year, yeah, we might have an amazing couple of weeks working out for an hour and a half at the gym every day. I mean, feels good, well, like in the moment, but it's not going to be sustainable. It's just not going to be sustainable, and so it won't lead to habits. So think of it this way. Consistency beats intensity every time. Um, I want to I want to share with you. This is a picture of my ex exercise clothes. Um, I started a running habit in beginning of 2019, January 2019. Uh, and one of the things that I started doing was putting my exercise clothes instead of in the closet, just on my nightstand. It seems super basic, almost uh, like what's the big deal, right? It seems uh, like well, uh, does that really matter? <laughs> um, turns out it does. And the reason is because of a principle called friction. So the more friction, the more steps you have to take between what you're doing right now and what you want to be doing, 
The more decisions you have to make or steps you have to take, the less likely you are to do that behavior. So getting up, it's a cold morning, got to get up and out of the down, out, for, out from under the down comforter, got to walk into the closet. It's dark. I can't hear my one-year-old's like on the edge of maybe getting up. Uh, so I'm trying to be quiet. I'm looking for my exercise clothes. Just think of this, right? I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm kind of feeling around in the dark. I don't want to turn on the light. Um, I can't quite feel the right shirt in, in shorts. Obviously right now I'd be wearing sweats, but, but in the summertime, um, it's just not there. And then I'm like, oh shoot, it's in the laundry hamper. You know, the, we, we, we wash the clothes, we just didn't fold them. And so, oh man. I've got to like go to the next room, sort through all that pile of clothes. I mean, just like friction, 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 friction. You know what my brain really wants to do before I did all that stuff? Stay in bed. Under the damn comforter. I mean, how annoying is all that stuff, right? Reduce the friction. Take out all the decision-making. Make it so easy you basically trip into the habit which is what's happening with these exercise clothes. I, uh, uh, I've gone one step further now <laughs> with this particular thing. I now sleep in them. You heard it here. I sleep in my exercise clothes. And the reason is, the reason is because it's one more step I took out of the process. And so the only thing I have to put on in the morning is my shoes. That's the only thing I don't sleep in. Um, and I have multiple sets, so it's not a problem and that sort of thing. I've worked that out. However, um, it's amazing. It's amazing what it does. Amazing. All right. Number two, many habits guarantee success. This increases your confidence as you are more and more likely to do the behavior. Right? Because focusing on consistency Basically, many habits give your brain the sense that success is right there. It's not this huge thing between you and getting to success. It's like, no, it's right there. It's almost guaranteed. And that increases as you, in fact, are successful. It increases your confidence because then you start looking backward and saying, oh, my gosh, I keep doing this every day. I'm winning. Like there's, a, there's evidence. And I'm getting better at this thing. Clearly, I mean, look at look what I've been doing for the last month. It's it's happening, right? And so there's a special kind of confidence that starts emerging inside of you when you when you have all of these wins over and over and over again. And it's called self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is your belief in your ability to influence an outcome. So it's kind of like how confident are you that you can actually do the thing that you're intending to do, right? You could think of like a one to 10 scale. So one to 10, are you five, are you seven, are you two? Well, it's often gonna depend on how successful or unsuccessful you've been at that particular behavior in the past. There's this famous psychologist named Albert Bandura, also incidentally from Stanford, um, he realized that self-efficacy is one of the most powerful predictors of success. If you have a lot of self-efficacy, you're going to actually follow through on your behaviors. If you don't, you're going to put in the effort, basically, it takes to get to the end goal. If you have low self-efficacy, usually you'll give up. So he wanted to know, how do you build self-efficacy? And what he found is, after about 10 years of research, <laughs> came down to one answer. <laughs> small successes. Small wins. They don't need to be big. They just need to be, have a pattern of winning, a pattern of doing the harder thing, of doing the new behavior. And if that happens, your self-efficacy level is going to grow and grow and grow. All right. So it matters that you depict those small wins. In other words, it matters that you have a visual system that captures the, what you're doing every day. If you don't have a tracking system, a habit tracking system, you're not going to tap into one of the deepest sources of motivation, which is a sense of progress. Teresa Mabel at Harvard Business School has shown that the, she calls it the progress principle. If you 
can see visual progress, you'll stay motivated. You can see yourself getting better because there's a system and you're keeping track of it. And you can actually point to it and say, look, I'm doing better. Here's the proof. Then you'll stay motivated. If you don't have a system like that, you lose motivation. Yeah, you're doing the thing every day. You just can't quite tell if you're getting better because there's no physical system, nothing to pr look at and, and prove that you're getting better. All right, so why do I have Jerry Seinfeld up here? Jerry Seinfeld's a very funny human, obviously. Um, and one of the reasons that he's so funny is uh, he has a really, really good habit tracking system. <laughs> there was this young comedian who asked Jerry how he became so funny. And Jerry just said, well, you know, I write jokes every day. And this young comedian was like, well, okay, that's nice. We uh, Don't we all write jokes every day? I mean, funny joke, Jerry. What, 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 what's your, come on, dude. You got, you got more than that, right? What's your secret sauce? I mean, how'd you become that funny? Heads above, you know, the rest of us. And um, he said, well, I mean, that's it. I just do write jokes every day. I mean, I don't know if there's any secret sauce. But he goes, you know, I do have a, I do have a kind of a system I use. And um, every day that I write jokes, I put, put big red X's on the, uh, on that, a big red X on that day. Once I've done with that day, I put a red X on that day. I've got this wall of calendars and it just keeps track of my system. And then he said to this young comedian, after a few days, you'll have a chain. Just keep at it and the chain will grow longer every day. You'll like seeing that chain, especially when you get a few weeks under your belt. Your only job is to not break the chain. So again, what's so powerful is a few different principles he's tapping into with this example. One is the visual tracking system. It's visual. You can see it. You can point to it. And once you have a few calendars and you're looking, you're like, wow, I'm really doing something. I mean, you can see it. I can actually see it with my eyes. You know, think about meditation. I want to do, create a meditation habit. Well, like, how do you see progress with meditation? How, what's changing? It's, it's difficult to put your finger on sometimes. What you can put your finger on is whether or not you meditated today. Did I meditate for 10 minutes? Oh, yeah, I did. Oh, yeah. How do I know? Well, it's in my tracking system. You just look right there. Good. So suddenly, what you're focused on, instead of outcomes, you're focused on behaviors. Behaviors are now becoming the metric of success. Whether I did it or not is the thing that you're defining as whether or not you were successful at that thing. And behaviors you have direct control over, whereas outcomes you have less control over. So if you want to lose weight, a lot of us do, um, and you have some goal of you losing, let's call it, say, 20 pounds, um, that's an outcome, right? And it's something that uh, you can't directly control. Now, you can indirectly have influence on it, but what you can directly control is whether or not you have a salad for lunch every day. What you can directly control is whether or not you show up at the gym every day or go for a run every day, or get your 10,000 steps every day. That's behavior. And if your behavior is the metric of success, and you literally create a tracking system like this, your motivation will be bottomless. That's deep, deep intrinsic motivation, and it will fuel your habit forming and, and behavior change success. All right, number three, many habits build motivation in this way, by, by this sort of visual system uh, or a tracking system where you kind of grow this self of co this confidence and self-efficacy. But they also build motivation in a different way, which is kind of fun, which is that motivation usually comes after action, not before. So if you know this, that motivation follows action, what you can do is you can hack your motivation system. Most of us sit there and wait to feel motivated in order to take action. Right? We go, we say to ourselves, I don't, I don't really feel like going to the gym. So then we don't go. Or I don't really feel like doing my homework. So we don't go. Or we don't, we don't do it. We procrastinate. We watch something. We, you know, watch an episode on Netflix, whatever. But if we actually just started the thing that we were avoiding, or I don't want to do the dishes. I don't feel like it. I'd rather just sit here and, you know, 
whatever, jump on social media. But once you start doing the thing, and one of the ways to do this, to overcome that procrastination hump, is to shrink the size of the task. So let's take the dishes example. I'm the dish guy in our family. Um, I don't like dishes, actually, but I do quite a few of them. Um, so how do I motivate myself to do the dishes? I pick up the family room. Now, wait, 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 James. Why would you pick up the family room? Because that's also part of my nightly routine, right? So dishes and family room pickup are just kind of what I do in the night. At night, that's my deal. So, so I know I got to get them both done. They're linked. I do them right, you know, back to back. But the family room pickup takes about five minutes. It's just the toys from the kids, and I got to put it in their bins and you know get it. You know, it's easy. It's just pickup, tidying. The dishes on the other end. That's a uh, usually a 30 to 45 minutes, sometimes an hour long job, depends. Uh, that's a big one. So if I take five minutes, to clean up the family room, it looks it looks like I've finished half of my work. Like the family room's done. Oh my gosh, wow. And all of a sudden, five minutes later, I'm like, wow, I've got all these oodles of motivation. Dishes, no problem. Totally, of course. Because now I'm in a different state. I just hacked my motivation by taking action on a small thing. And now I want to continue. Think of it this way. Brains hate starting, but they love continuing. Brains hate starting, but they love continuing. So if you can get your brain to start on something, think of your inbox. We've all been here, right? I have 100 unread emails. Oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed. Avoid, avoid, avoid. No problem. Set your timer for 10 minutes on your phone. 10 minutes. Clear out as much as you can in 10 minutes. You'll be able to get rid of a lot of spam, I promise. And then by the end of those 10 minutes, then decide if you want to continue. Right, so 10 minutes, your brain's like, oh yeah, okay, we can handle 10 minutes, but man, I'm not clearing out this whole thing. Then you get going, you're into it 10 minutes, and you cleared out 32 emails. And then you're like, ooh, the timer goes off, and you're like, but I can't stop because I'm on a roll. Right? Have you ever felt that experience? Again, brains hate starting, but they love continuing. So once you shrink the task to get over the difficulty and get going, take action, then you're going to want to keep going. This is literally the hack of procrastination and, and, and the best way to activate your motivation when you're not feeling motivated. All right, so many habits grow. They start small, but they actually grow. How and why do they do that? Typically, it's through bonus reps. In other words, so BJ Fogg, this curious professor at Stanford who would do his two push-ups, he would actually add five or 10 more each time, 15 or 20. Why not? He already got down on the floor and went through that, right? So he did his two, and it's like, you know, why don't we just throw in a handful more? And so bonus reps are typically how habits grow. However, I mean, I'm going to just mention this one thing, which is it's also okay to have a small, medium, and large version of every habit. These are called elastic habits, so that the habit is flexible, right? So for example, in my morning run, you know, that I was mentioning, the typical run I do is about 20 minutes. It's about two miles. Um, but every once in a while, my eight-year-old wakes up early. And she's like, hey, dad. And I'm like, oh, it's just about to get out the door. How you doing? And she's like, can I come? And uh, in that moment, I have a choice, right? I have to either tell her no, or I say yes, but I have to modify the routine. Because, you know, two miles with, with legs that are half as long as mine is a long ways. So, so we do, we, I modify the routine. I shrink the difficulty. I goes from about two miles to about a quarter mile. We run around the park by our house and then we go back to the house. Now I did a mini version of the same behavior. So again, my two mile runs, my kind of medium level habit. I did a mini version of the same behavior and guess what? It still counts. It still counts. I still did the thing. It's it got it's this snapped me out of the all or nothing thinking trap. It's like if it's not a full workout, it's not worth it. It's like no, 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 no. You're playing a long game here. 
you're actually creating a routine. So any one day, the quality of that workout or that whatever you're doing is much less important than the fact that you did something rather than nothing. And then if you want to track a small, medium, and large version of it, let me just show you the actual habits tracker that I now use is this. Let me try to hold this up so you can see. I know, I know the picture is small, but you can see the different colors, right? So these are my habits along this side. Uh, green is a mini habit. Blue is a medium habit. And red is the large version of the habit. So again, there's my reading habit, for example, is mostly large. My meditation habit is mostly blue. Uh, exercise is mostly blue. But again, there's some green sprinkled in there, which means those are days that didn't go so well, but I got it done. I got something done. All right, I got the mini version done. Now I have these other habits, which are just growing right now. They're they're smaller, um, which is exercise S. There's exercise A, which is aerobic. Exercise S, which is strength, actually. And that's, uh, I'm trying to do more of it. So I've got this sort of push-up, sit-up, you know, routine that takes me, you know, about five minutes. Um, but then again, I occasionally I'm thrown in some blues where I do a full strength workout. Uh, journaling, same thing. Right, this is my gratitude journal. So I've got a one sentence version, a three sentence version, and a full page version of, of that habit. Sleep, same thing, right? I've got a small, medium, and large. So again, the tracking system tracks not only whether or not I did it, but what degree of difficulty on that particular day. And then you can start, start seeing patterns, right? In your behavior, you start seeing like, oh, I'm really staying green on this particular habit. Maybe I want to increase the intensity now, now that it's established. Or I'm missing days. And if you're missing days, the, the I, I hope, obvious um, prescription is shrink your mini habit. Get it smaller. You really should not miss a day. Mini habits should take one to five minutes. And even if it's 11.30 at night or midnight or 1 a.m., typically you should still be able to do a mini habit because it's that easy. All right. Number four, mini habits build willpower, which is this uh, you know side benefit of building habits over time. Your your willpower battery can get bigger, get stronger. So this is uh, just a kind of perk of becoming better at your habits. And the last thing is that mini habits boost autonomy or a sense of choice and flexibility. You can take them on vacation and they don't break. So this is this resilience we're talking about, right? Um, they're, they're, they're small and flexible instead of big and brittle. All right, three tips for setting up your mini habits. And by the way, small and flexible instead of big and brittle is a direct quote from uh, BJ Fogg. That's how he frames that. Here's um, three tips for setting up your mini habits. Probably the most important thing you will take away from this presentation is this one sentence. After I blank, then I'll blank. After I put my toothbrush in the toothbrush holder, then I'll write three things I'm grateful for in my gratitude journal. After I step out of the shower, then I will meditate for five minutes. After I open the fridge, then I will eat one carrot stick. After I sit down at my desk, then I will plan my day, the plan the three biggest priorities for my day before I open my email. Right? Set the tone and priorities that I have, and then you know, dip into what everybody needs from me. So again, after I blank, then I'll blank. If you structure your new habit that you're trying to create in this way, if you write it as this sentence and just plug in those holes, the first hole is what something you already do. The second hole, the second blank is something you're trying to do that's new, a new habit. You're literally piggybacking on top of an existing habit. The likelihood that you'll follow through if you structure it in this way, if you write this sentence, goes from with that so without the sentence it's 33 percent likelihood that you'll follow through if you create it in this way it goes up to 75 percent likelihood that you'll follow through it's insane how powerful the sentence is all right so when you set up the habit this is the way that you set up the habit the second tip is to celebrate progress so when you've done something good when you've done the behavior, tell yourself you just did something hard. Tell yourself you focused on consistency. Tell yourself, nice job, well done. 
You know, you can do a little fist pump if you want. Actually, on my run, the last thing I do on my run, there's these bushes so nobody can kind of see me, but I throw my hands up in the air on the last corner of my run. You know, like I'm coming through the finish line of a marathon. I just ran two miles, you guys. It's like no big deal. But, you know, I'm like, it's like I can hear chariots of fire playing in the background, you know? Um, and I tell myself, nice job. You didn't feel like doing this this morning, but you still did it. You just did something hard. You chose the harder option. Well done. Nice job. That releases dopamine and dopamine is critical, critical. It, it basically, think of it this way. What the, the actual neuroscience of it is, it accelerates how fast the habit forms. So if you celebrate immediately after doing the behavior, you're, you're going to speed up your habit forming process. It's a way to hack the speed or pace that your habit forms at. Pretty cool, right? All right, last thing. You don't want to do more than about two to four habits at a time. Now, specifically mini habits, two to four at a time. Three is usually with mini habits. It, with habits is the number I like best. If it's a full-sized habit or a, even a hard habit, you really don't want to work on more than one or two at a time. And again, it takes 66 days to form. So if you've got six New Year's resolutions, great. Do one every, every two months. Focus on one. January and February, it's sleep. March and April, it's exercise. May and June, it's my relationship, my, my primary relationship. Whatever that looks like for you, space them out. Do habits sequentially, not simultaneously. Now, again, this is mostly because of willpower, because willpower runs out. So you can handle up to a point doing, doing more than one. You can do, again, two to four if they're smaller because of the difficulty thing. You use less willpower when you're doing many habits. But that's the balance. That's the tension you're always balancing. All right. I created a PDF of everything we've talked about today. If you would like a copy of a summary of this talk, it's also an infographic form, so it's easy and you know to save on your phone, that sort of thing. Text the word habit to 44144. Text the word habit. That's what you actually type in the text to, it's only five digits, 44. One, four, four. All right. And uh, I believe we're also going to talk about the course, but I just want to invite Jonah uh, back on the call and, uh, and go into questions and um, thoughts or questions here. Go ahead, Jonah. Yeah. Th thank you so much, James. Already, I'm like, I was taking notes and going back being like, I need to go rewrite my 2022 <laughs> resolutions. But I love how you put it too. It is, it, it's so much easier to think of just a little action. And then I, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's, it's easy in life to come up with an identity for yourself and then yeah. try and make the actions that match that identity and yep. the switch to the other way around does immediately start to make it more palpable. If I drink more water, I'll be someone who drinks more water versus the other way. <laughs> so I love it. Right. Yeah. Right. And everyone, please pop your questions in the comments. If you have any, I see you all have been very active there and that's awesome. We have a little more time with James. Uh, so we'll get to those questions as they come in. Uh, but before we do that, did want to talk about the course. First, the links to the course, they're in the comments pinned to the top, they're in the description, and they'll be emailed along with the replay. Um, but can we dive a little more into the course? What's the experience like for someone who enters into it? Is there a community? Is it self-paced? What's the, what's the format there? Yeah, so the course, uh, it's, it's mixed, actually. It's a hybrid. Uh, so there's part that's on demand that, you, that you're doing at your own pace, and there's a part that's live. So um, there are uh, there are four 75 minute sessions that are um, pre recorded um, that that have um, uh, video, audio, and then they have uh, exercises that are ways of implementing the learning. Right, ways to actually practice essentially. Uh, what it is you're learning, as well as curated readings, uh, a curated reading list. So, so you know, we all know we're busy. So, um, if I'm trying to learn about this particular topic, what is what is the the best? Uh, I've read, you know, literally hundreds of hundreds of books and thousands of scientific articles, essentially. So you don't have to, right, <laughs> um, right, um, and summarized it into uh, what I do, which is making that science applicable, relevant, easy to understand, and really easily to easy to apply in your life. So that's the sort of 
on-demand portion, and then we do meet live. So for every two pre-recorded sessions, we meet live once. Um, so it's four pre-recorded sessions, two live sessions, um, and um, that uh, live portion actually starts uh, on January uh, 27th, is, is coming right up. Um, and um, and then I, I every eight weeks, that portion of my course, uh, I do mo more than just the habits course, but this portion of of my, my, my course series, the habits portion, um, uh, repeats itself every eight weeks. Oh, cool. Okay. So if you miss this coming section of the live, you'll have access to the future, the future ones as they come in. Correct. And what is, Correct. what are those lives like? What, what's, is it for people to share? Is it you mostly talking? What's, what's that look like? Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's basically uh, a deep dive on the learning. It's, cool. it's, it's, it's an open, it, it so we have, um, it, we, I do it over Zoom. So, so it's, uh, you know, anywhere from 15 to 35 people typically. Um, so it's typically a small, uh, you know, group where you can get pretty much all your questions answered. Um, and we, we dive in to the topics, um, what, you know, where, where many habits goes, what it looks like in this situation or this situation when you're trying to apply it here. Um, so it's it's a it's a robust discussion Q and A workshopping uh, and sort of getting into the granular details of actually applying it in your life. That's cool. So you you can learn all the theory, but in these live sessions, you really focus on like how do I use it and That's apply correct. it. Cool. That's and correct. so I had a couple questions I wanted to start the Q and A off with, but also wanted to mention that. For a week, that course is discounted. If you go through those links here on YouTube or the event page, it's $100 off. So it's only $197, but hop on that opportunity while it lasts. And then is there, if someone is signing up just shortly after those lives go, does that affect the experience a whole lot or can that person then come back later? Is it lifetime access? Yeah, it is lifetime access, and they oh, can great. come back later. And I do record the lives um, in case uh, you know you miss one or you 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 know have to access it that way. Um, so technically, you don't have to show up at the lives. Um, although I think you know you typically get more out of it if you do. Right. Well, and so a couple of questions that came to mind as you were presenting. When it, how do I want to put this? When it comes to tackling things, like I'm someone who's always been attracted to something where if I try it once, I'm really good at it. And I'm like, great, we can keep that as something I do. When it comes to those things that you don't click with right away, even if you've broken into the mini habits, do you have another additional kind of reward system you can give yourself? Or do you find accountability useful? I know there's debates about you know, telling someone you're going to do it. Sometimes it works, sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Are there systems you can set up around those things that are not necessarily challenging, yeah. but you're just not good at? Like, I know I could be a decent, you know, cartoonist or draw, but I suck at it. So I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have, I get no joy out of practicing it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, yeah, there's a couple, there's a handful of, so, so think of it like this, this habit toolkit we're talking about, you've got lots of different tools in the toolkit. So you can deploy, and many habits really is just one tool. Mm, okay. To be clear. Um, there are other ways to get yourself to do the hard thing is kind of what we're talking about. Um, I, I sort of alluded to forcing functions. Uh, an accountability partner is a form of, it's a, a psychologist called these forcing functions. So if somebody shows up at your door, um, 7 a.m. in the morning and it's like, hey, are we going for the run? You're obviously going to be ready <laughs> when they right, show up. Right, right. Whereas if you're having to, if you're going solo, there's nobody there. You, you don't have the anticipation that you would let someone down by not being ready. It's just you with you, you know? So it's like, right. eh, I might slide by this time. So, so actually other people are one of the very most gentle and um, natural forms of a forcing function because they're, they play on our social instincts just so. Basically, we care more about our social relationships than we do about conserving energy. Mm -hmm. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? 
Yes. So, so we care more about our, and, and our reputation, actually, we're managing, we don't want to, we don't want to be, we don't want to be the person who lets the other person down and they, we don't want the other person to think we're lazy. Right. You know, so, right. so that being the case, you know, you want to use that to your advantage to get yourself to do the hard thing. If you know that about, you know, that's just human nature, um, then, uh, okay, cool. So like, I can actually leverage that and use that to get myself to do the hard thing each time. So yeah, setting up some way to, to be accountable to someone is, is, is very good. Doing it together is even better. Um, but, um, I, you know, I, I know I mentioned this, <laughs> another forcing function. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this, this awesome little lockbox here, timed lockbox. Um, I'm shocked at what a difference it makes. Mm. The fact that I can't physically access my phone during my workday or at night when I don't want to be distracted, it's just like, oh, well, I guess I'm doing something else then. <laughs> and you've never <laughs> caught yourself with a crowbar at 2 a.m. trying to... <laughs> <laughs> or a drill, just like yeah. drilling all these holes and breaking into it. I'm getting um, good at drilling now. That's, <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah, no, it, it uh, you know, you could be conservative. Maybe you just want to do it for an hour at the beginning or 30 minutes. Sure, or something. Sure. But, um, <laughs> but now I do it for like eight hours, you know, I do it for eight hour stretches, of course, at night or 10 hour stretches or whatever during my work day, you know, it's all, all until I'll just think of the time, do it till 5 PM or whatever. Um, and and I've, I have these workarounds, you know, I can always text my, I can text via my computer so that if I need to get hold of my wife, for example, uh, in an you urgent situation. It. Yeah. And, and she knows this, like, like, so there's, there's the, there's the, there are these ways to make it work actually. Um, but but in terms of doing the hard thing, like being a cartoonist, as you mentioned, it's not that we don't have the willpower or discipline to do that hard thing and actually develop that skill over time. What it usually is, is there's something more attractive and easier on offer right in front of us. Uh, Typically speaking, it's the yeah, fun. Yeah. Or if you're drawing on an iPad, it's a swipe away to be somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, but I love what you said here with your course and just in general, it's not about one hack. You're building a tool set. It sounds like that can be applied in a variety of ways to relevant habits, right? That's kind of what I'm That's hearing. That's exactly right. That's, That's exactly awesome. Right. And uh, one other question then we from me, and then we did have a question in the comments here. Um, I have a sister who's 10 years younger. And she's identified, I forget the specific name. It's like Gen X burnout. There, her, her and her friends have a name for this thing, which is when you come from very supportive parents, mm -hmm. which we're lucky to have, mm -hmm. who are fine if you fail and fine if you succeed. We've noticed in our generation a kind of apathy to failure where we're loved anyways. Mm -hmm. So that kind of accountability to the people around us gets more difficult, the more you want people who accept you, but also if they don't hold you accountable. Sure. Do you have any, any recommendations or hacks of how to like start chipping away at that process? Because it's obviously a long one from your childhood, but if, if the people around you accept you however you are, how do you hold yourself accountable? Yeah, it's such a good question. Such a good question. Yeah, you're do, in a sense the like love is not contingent on achievement. They're not they're not linked together. Is how I'm hearing what you're saying. Yes. Um. And, and typically speaking, that's a good thing. <laughs> it is. It is a that, great. The, that's totally of, an internal of, of, thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 So so think of it like this. So competition. So 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 we tend to think of accountability as um, a stick. Mm. Does that make sense? Like, oh, I'm going to get, you know, punishment is a strong word, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 there, there's some, there's some consequence is probably the right word. Um, if I don't do the thing or show up in this way or show up at all. Right. Um, whereas I think accountability that's a threat system, right? There's a, there's a, there's, it's mm. a fear, it's a fear-based motivational place that that's coming from. So fear can get you to do hard things. And, um, and, and you know, it, it does work. And, and it's very, one of those strongest emotions we have, which is why people lean on it a lot. But it's a short game, not a long game. Mm. Fear is a short game, not a long game. 
In other words, a parent can get their child to conform to their wishes, to, um, um, to be compliant. Right. But as Edward Dietschy, one of the most famous researchers around intrinsic motivation, what he said was, what, every time you get compliance, you plant a seed of defiance. <laughs> yeah. That's what I mean by yeah. the long game. Yeah, you'll get what you want in the short term, which is obedience or whatever the parent has in mind for some ideal. I actually hate the word obedience. Um, but, um, but, 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 but doing the, the thing the parent's asking. I mean, I'm using this example of parent to child because it's easy to understand. Um, but the same is true, I think, in, in the way it, where our brain works in terms of motivation systems. Um, what you're really wanting to tap into is intrinsic motivation. Hmm. Think, think of it this way. Carrots and sticks, that's extrinsic motivation, right? Intrinsic motivation comes from a, a different kind of motivation system. And it's not fear. It's what I described in the presentation, which was a sense of mastery or progress. Mm. And confidence, right? That you build over time with the... It's the confidence you build over time that fuels your sense of reward. That is the reward. It's like, I'm getting better at this thing. And we are endlessly motivated to get better at things when we can sense or tell that we actually are in fact getting better. Right. So, so, so think of instead of accountability, there's another way to think of this. Instead of being against me against other, which is a competitive thing, think of it as, as me against me. Mm. Mm -hmm. That every tracking system that I'm building, what I'm actually doing is designing a system where I can tell what my baseline was a month ago. And then I'm measuring a month later and I'm looking backward at that baseline and I'm asking myself, am I better today at this thing than I was a month ago? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is yes, and if I've depicted that again, like in a system and I can actually tell how I've done, at least that I've done the things that would make me better, right? We're talking about behaviors. I will be endlessly motivated to continue to put in the effort and hard work to continue to get better at that thing. This is mm -hmm. why, by the way, kids have an obsession with mastery. The reason is because their learning curves are so, are so tight, they're so small. Mm. So my, my one-year-old is just like, it's crazy how fast he learns stuff. Yeah. It's just insane. And the reason is he, he, he learns so quickly. Kids are obviously like sponges, you know, in terms of how quickly their brains pick up on things. Um, it takes more effort as adults to do that rate, the rate of learning. So we have to, we have to set these things up in a way that keeps us motivated. And one of the best ways is again, me against me, not me against other and me at time one compared to me at time two. So it's really looking, I'm not measuring towards some ideal or goal that I want to hit. Say I want to lose 20 pounds. It's really like, okay, what was my baseline? In, on January 1st, and how am I doing? It's March 1st. How am I doing compared to my baseline? It's like the in the book Gap in the Game by Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan. They always say, always measure backward. Right, right. Right, and yeah. that's what will keep you motivated because you won't be disappointed by your results that don't meet your ideal. What you'll be is on fire because you keep seeing progress. And that's where the confidence comes from, right? Because rather than a like feedback chain of just failure, you're actually building the, that makes so much sense. Uh, we have to wrap up soon here, but uh, Susan Inspired Art uh, Studio had a great question, which is say it's not, and and I hope I'm, I'm uh, interpreting this right, uh, Susan, but say it's not a physical practice, but a thought pattern. And I, I interpret that as like, it could be positive or like negative, like talk you do to yourself or any of this, but if it's totally just in the way you're thinking, mm. are these systems applied the same? Are there different approaches to that? What do you do when it's just your mind that you're battling? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so there's different, different again, back to the tools within the habit toolkit. So I, I use the example of after then plans at the end of the presentation, after I blank, then I'll blank. There's a, the original version of after then plans were actually if then plans. So if then plans are slightly different than after then plans and they work mm -hmm. better for thought habits. So because thoughts are unpredictable, 
I don't know when I'm going to have some thought about my that's not kind to myself, or it's a, maybe a, a, a negative self narrative. You know, I'm, oh, I'm such a loser. I did that thing again, or why did I do that? Or I messed up. Like, you know, negative self talk. I don't know exactly when that's going to happen. That's where right. the if if is so important. So if I find myself, you know, getting down on myself or or, or saying that thing that I always say to myself, and usually we have a, a couple of phrases that tend to repeat themselves. If I say this, then I will pause re and restate that as I, you know, I used to, or or, or that that was the one point of me. The, the mm. negative self-talking version of me. And and I'd like to be the 2.0 version of me. So so it's sort of like just literally pausing and recognizing like, oh, that was who I used to be. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I, I recognize you voice. That's right. the old me, that's the 1.0 me. And right now I'm the 2.0 me. And the 2.0 me actually engages in self-compassion when things don't go right, instead of self-loathing. Right, okay. So, so it's it's finding it and flipping it. Mm -hmm. um, but if then plans work beautifully like this, you it's just same structure. If blank, then blank. If I have this thought, then I'll reframe it to this. Nice, I love that. Uh, we do have to wrap up for time here, but thank you right. so much, James, for taking the time to share your expertise and also just giving us some like actionable stuff we can take away today is so helpful. And for everyone who's been watching and commenting, thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed your time here, please like and subscribe to the Discover channel. We're continually trying to bring entrepreneurs, educators, uh, I mean, psychologists, all sorts of people here to the channel to help us all grow and become better humans in every possible way. We appreciate you all so much. And before we head out, James, where can people find you? Um, my website's brainbydesign.com. Mm -hmm. And if anyone wants to reach out, can they email you? Oh, yeah. My, my email my email's j james at brainbydesign.com. Super. Love easy. it. Love it. So, yeah, well, thanks. I'm, I'm on social media as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you once again so much for joining us today. And have a wonderful day. I know I'm going to just go right away and rewrite all my resolutions. <laughs> it's been a blast. But all we'll right, see Dad, you soon. Pleasure. Farewell.